blessing that was. That's Batala New York, an Afro-Brazilian group. I hope you check them out. That was truly amazing. Thank you. Wow. So let's get started. Good evening to everyone. Uh, we are gathered here tonight on the unceded land of the Lenape peoples, past, present, and future. Our collective witnessing of this reality continues the process of transforming ongoing legacies of settler colonialism, indigenous erasure, and genocide. This commitment to witness includes a recognition of the connected histories and futures of Black and Indigenous peoples. We bear witness to the fact that nation building institutions of all kinds were founded on both the displacement and erasure of Indigenous peoples and also the abduction of Black people from ancestral places for use as forced labor to the benefit of the planter class, global trade, and for purposes of building nation and state. May we never deny this, never forget this, and may we always turn to each other in mutuality and witness in this life and beyond. Ashe and Amen. On behalf of the Tishman Center, where I have the honor of serving as Associate Director, my name is Mia Charlene White, by the way, I forgot to say that. And, <laughs> and here at the New School where I teach courses in environment, race, and solidarity economies, I am honored to welcome you to tonight's very special public keynote by Dr. Beverly Wright. I expect that for many of you, Dr. Wright needs no introduction, but for those few who have not yet encountered her work in the world, Dr. Wright is an environmental justice scholar and the advocate, author, civic leader, professor of sociology, and the founder and executive director of the Deep South Center for Environmental Justice. That is this nation's first ever environmental justice center. <clears throat> Under the Biden administration, Dr. Wright was appointed to the White House Environmental Justice Advisory Council, where she advises on how the federal government can address current and historic environmental injustices. Born and raised in New Orleans, Dr. Wright has both experienced and witnessed the polluting effects of Cancer Alley, which as you know, is an 85 mile stretch of land between Baton Rouge and New Orleans that is home to over 150 petrochemical plants and refineries. Through decades of research and community organizing, she found the effects of polluting industries were only made worse by the absence of community input. She developed what is now known as the community model, a partnership between communities and universities that integrates community concerns and real life experiences into research and policy making for academic edu academics, educators, and researchers. Under her guidance, the Deep South Center for Environmental Justice has addressed environmental and health inequities along the Mississippi River and coastal regions of Louisiana for two decades, while providing education, health, and safety training, and job placement for residents in communities impacted by climate change. It also developed the first ever environmental justice map to show the connection between race and pollutants. And this map literally became the basis for how the Environmental Protection Agency determined an environmental justice community to be eligible for funding. Building on this research, Dr. Wright developed a groundbreaking curriculum that has introduced thousands of students in the New Orleans public school system to environmental justice. She also manages hazardous waste worker training programs that embrace a transformative work-based curriculum and a holistic approach to learning for young men and women living near contaminated sites resulting in their employment. 
Alongside other environmental justice organizations, Dr. Wright debuted the first ever climate justice pavilion inside the blue zone at COP27, which was the 2022 United Nations Climate Change Conference. The pavilion brought together representatives from the global south, the United States environmental justice movement and indigenous peoples from around the world to spotlight the voices of communities disproportionately impacted by climate change. Dr. Wright is the recipient of numerous prestigious awards, including the Robert Wood Johnson Community Health Leadership Award, the Environmental Protection Agency's Environmental Justice Achievement Award, the Rainbow Push Coalition Community Award, the Ford Motor Company's Freedom Sisters Award, the prestigious Heinz Award, as well as the 2010 Beta Kappa Chi Humanitarian Assistance Award bestowed by the National Institute of Science and the Conrad Arensberg Award given by the Society for the Anthropology of Work. The GRIO Awards selected her for their 100 History Makers in the Making in 2010, and she also received the Urban Affairs Association Sage Activist Scholar Award the following year. Dr. Wright is the author of numerous scholarly books and articles, including the co-authored Race, Place, and Environment After Hurricane Katrina, and The Wrong Complexion for Protection, how the government response endangers African American communities. Dr. Wright received her bachelor's from Grambling College and her master's and PhD in sociology from the State University of New York at Buffalo, where she also received the Distinguished Alumni Award recently. We see in Dr. Wright's life a model for how to face the world we are living in today. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Beverly Wright. Thank you very much. I always uh, tell people that it's so surprising to me now that if I walk in the room, I meet people, they clap or say nice things. I was so accustomed to hearing boos and hisses <laughs> whenever I enter the room. And I, at one point I said, you know, I must not be doing anything right anymore because when you get the hisses, you know you're on the right track. You know, and so I would walk into rooms with the chemical manufacturers and they would be whispering and making noise and I would just smile. I'm like, I got you. That's when you know you have them. So this is different for me, but I want you to know I really, really, really appreciate um, your applauding me. Um, I want this, this, this picture right at the top is just took me back. And um, you notice I'm at the top, and that's Peggy, right down under me, right there by my environmental justice. That's Peggy. We have been working together for, oh my God, now I don't know how many years, but it's been a very long time that we've been on the battlefield together, and we still work very closely together along with uh, Dr. Bullock. But I wanted to point that out. Peggy, do you remember that picture? That was in Johannesburg. <laughs> yeah. So this is a picture that I don't remember as well. Okay, oh, good. I don't remember this picture. <laughs> um, and how I got it is very interesting. There was something that I, that I, some credential I needed, and I had to go back to the University of New Orleans to get something about work or, oh, it was, and when you get older, Medicare, you know, you have to show that you've been working. And, they, and the guy said, oh, God, it's been so long ago. I don't know if we have that. And so he went back into a file cabinet, and he came out, and my picture was there. But my afro was kind of torn off on the side at the top. And um, Ginger, my extraordinary uh, communications person, said, oh, I can fix that. And she did. I looked up my... <laughs> My afro was all the way around again. It was just, and of course it was my children who wanted this picture. I almost don't remember this person, but I was 26 years old. 
with my first job as a professor at the University of New Orleans, I'm sorry, assistant professor. Um, so let me start my presentation. I've already used up too much of my time. Um, so to tell you, tell you a little bit about how I started, I need to tell you a little bit about who I am. How did I become Beverly? To the chagrin of many people and with love from others. But I actually grew up in segregation. You know, I grew up riding in the back of the bus. Um, there were voting restrictions that you couldn't believe. My mother went to register to vote in 1950 something. And they asked her, how many, how many gumdrops, I think it was, jelly beans, how many jelly beans were in this jar? And, it's, and, and she had to answer that question. And she said, it's however many you say it is. That's the kind of mother I had even back then. Um, voting was a really, really big thing. Joining the NAACP was almost uh, set you up for lynching during my time. The police would stop you, they'd look in your wallet, and if you had an NAACP card, they would beat you up. I mean, it was really difficult to even organize. So imagine a child growing up with really activist parents. My mother started the first NAACP chapter in New Orleans at my church. So I grew up in this community that was defiant, if you know what I mean, about segregation. They thought it was demeaning. They were highly religious or spiritual, and they saw a contradiction between Christian principles and segregation and hate. So I grew up in that kind of family and in that community. And I can tell you, when I was growing up, all children got whippings as they called them, a spankings. It was allowed, in fact, it was expected. And the only whipping I ever got from my grandmother was one where I went into a place that wouldn't let us go inside. You had to go to the window where they said colored. It was a real hot day, she had sent me on an errand and I had 10 cents for my, we call them huckabucks. It was um, like Kool-Aid that you freeze and it's in a cup. Uh, 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 I don't know what you call them now, but that's what it was. And I was walking and sweating and I saw that window and somebody said, don't you go there. But I looked at it and said, oh shoot, she, she won't know. I went to that window and by the time I got to the corner, my grandmother was standing in the door. She already knew that I had gone there. You know why? The neighbors called and told on me. And I got the worst whipping I've ever received in my life and she said, if you can't go in, they can't have your money. And I raised you better than that. So when people ask me, why are you so outspoken? Why are you, it's all I know. I grew up in a community that was defiant. I grew up in a family that believed in principles and they believed in justice and fairness. And I don't know why I'm getting weepy about that all of a sudden, it seems really odd for me. And then I went to Grambling College, an all black, um, college at that time, not a university, in northern Louisiana, the headquarters of the Klan at that time. And a lot of people don't know that black students were killed at Jackson State and Southern University before Kent State. And then they were killed again after Kent State at Southern. So Southern University in New Orleans, in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, had students murdered twice, not once by the National Guard. But all people know about is Kent State, and Jackson State was actually the first, first school. And I was suspended from Grambling for demonstrating. Um, not a surprise to anyone that knew me well. But in spite of all of that, I finished at, at Grambling. That's a longer story. And I was accepted at six what we call predominantly white universities. And I chose SUNY at Buffalo. First, because they gave me more money than anybody else. <laughs> And secondly, because my fiance was in Detroit and I picked it because of money and proximity to my fiance. The money part was right. That second part wasn't, I was married for three months. <laughs> Shortest marriage ever, three months. And I chose SUNY because of money and a man. It's quite, quite amazing. <laughs> But um, at that school, I, I also was introduced to Love Canal. Made no connection 
between Love Canal and where I live. I, I mean, oblivious, no connection, just, just amazed at the fact that a facility, an industry could poison so many people and kill children because the children were dying. That's why they started looking into it. So that was my first connection to facility siting and poisoning of children by an industry that everybody, you know, um, depended on it. To me, it was like a company town almost. So everybody depended on it. And this set me on, on my path to where I am. So then I went from there to the University of New Orleans. At that time, it was called LSU, Louisiana State University. If that doesn't make you want to puke sometimes, I don't know why it wouldn't. But for those of us who live there, that's where David Duke was educated at the Louisiana State University. And I will forever hold that against them. Uh, but I was an assistant professor of sociology. And while there, I began to do what I wanted to do. That was research that helped my own community. At that time, strictly New Orleans, all the research, working with uh, the Urban League, the state of Black New Orleans, all of that kind of work. And then joining up with uh, professors who were in African American studies departments on white campuses, which was fairly new at that time. And I met uh, Robert Bullard at that same time because all of us who were at predominantly white schools were trying to find organizations with Black people in it because we were so isolated and alone at those universities. I, I, the first day there, and I'm going too long on this because I've got a lot to say, but I'm gonna say this. The first time I showed up on campus in my Grand Prix white with red interior, <laughs> that was in 1974. And I drove to the faculty parking lot and I was like, oh my God, I lucked up, I got a really good spot. And I pulled in and when I got out, this man was in the car. He had parked behind me and he had this frown on his face. He said, are you faculty? I looked, yes, I am. You know, but the fact that he would question me made him something about me probably being black and also being very young at the time, 26, he decided he had the right to challenge me in a parking lot. That was just the beginning of a really horrible, horrible relationship with faculty members on that campus. I also was in a department where I was the only woman and the only black. They were chewing tobacco and spitting in cans. It was the most disgusting thing I had ever seen in my life. But I was back with the rednecks. I had been in Buffalo, New York, you know, and I was good, came back with dashikis and you know, head wraps. And then I'm in a department of all redneck white men. It was quite an experience. But I'll leave you with this. An interaction with Beverly Lillian Bates Hendrix Wright was a lesson for them. I left there with tenure, which they tried to deny me. And after I got what I wanted, I left. But I stood in that fight with them for 15 years at that school with a salary of $32,000 a year when I left. Poorly paid, awful situation, but it was home. And that also molded me for what I wanted to do next. When I got to um, what got me into developing this center was really where I lived. It, everything was personal. Everything was personal with me getting to doing what I did. It came from my family, it came from all of my experiences. But this is Cancer Rally, and I like people to see that because what's been left for us is land fit only for dead people. So our, our people have to go back to the graveyards of their families, sometimes having to go behind bars because the facilities have moved, encroached upon all the land. So they have to go through a, a gate to get to the graveyard because that's the only thing that's left. So if that doesn't make an impression on you, I don't know what would. Uh, dealing with all of these kinds of in, 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 all these kinds of things, so I'm going to very quickly tell you about the Mississippi River Chemical Card, and I'm going to go fast because I think most of you know something about it. And Mia did a great job of telling you about it in the very beginning. So it really is an 85-mile stretch of land between New Orleans and Baton Rouge, 
It yeah. was 132 petrochemicals until the last two years. So we're actually going backwards instead of forward. Uh, the petrochemical plants have increased in Louisiana rather than diminishing. And there are 29 additional ones online to be placed, to be placed in mostly black communities. In Ascension Parish, one little parish, they're trying to put nine new facilities. But they're putting them in Donaldsonville, which is the black part of Ascension Parish. The other part of Ascension Parish is for white people, so there are no new facilities going there. What's going on in Louisiana is criminal, and it is, is in fact getting worse, in my opinion. So to give you an idea, these are the, the little towns along the Mississippi River. The curve that you see, that's like water. That's the Mississippi, Mississippi River. But this map shows the chemicals that they're exposed to. Most communities are almost fence line with chemicals. And can you imagine living with this large number of chemicals? That's what they're living with, and it's, it's, it's killing us. We have some of the highest cancer rates in the nation. We're 30% higher than white people in the top seven cancers. And so white people are 30% higher than the national average. Black people are 30% higher than white people. That sounds like 60% to me, but it may not be. You know, you statisticians may see it differently, and I'm fine with that. But it's a lot higher. And we believe that has something to do with it. So, you know, the petrochemical companies say, we came, we transformed the land, we, we turned farmland into brick houses. But the people who lived there gave it that name, Cancer Alley. And I always think about driving from New Orleans to Baton Rouge when I was a kid with my parents. And we would hit a certain point, point and my, it would stink. So as kids were like, oh, you did it, you did it, you know. And my dad would say, mm-hmm, smells like money. We had no idea that this, these facilities were killing us. It took us a long time to figure that out. And it's also extremely dangerous because of, of the lack of regulations. And um, the number of inspectors we have for a lot of this would blow your mind. It's nowhere near what we need. And these companies are all in bed with our politicians. And, and we just elected a governor who is absolutely in bed with politicians. So we're in a, a bad place right now. And I, I, don't, I don't know where we get out, but we can't give up the fight. And then in 1992, something dramatic happened. Um, I think Bullen and I had started writing articles about toxic waste. Uh, the, the, the first one was called The Politics of Pollution. I remember it. And so all of a sudden, people started hearing whispers in the corridor about, you know, we're really sick. Maybe, in fact, it's because of all of this stuff. They were noticing things changing. So I was contacted by community members to testify about what I had been speaking on, just a little bit, though, to tell you the truth, of what I thought was happening. And so being a sociologist, um, I was at Xavier, and I said, well, I've been to individual communities, but I had never taken the ride up River Road, as it's called. So I took two of my Xavier University students, and we got in um, my, mom, my mommy van, I'm moving on, and drove up river. And I just couldn't believe what I saw. I mean, I just could not believe that people would be living fence line to these communities. And that's my little Previa van from back then. And I guess the worst thing of it, and I don't say this all the time, but while we were driving through the community, the white sections, which were beautiful and further away, somebody called in my license plate and said that somebody had stolen a van and they were driving. They called, called Xavier because when they looked up the license plate, they saw it was Beverly Wright from Xavier. They turned me in and the police everywhere. And they said, when they saw who I was with two students, they said, oh, we, got, we thought you were casing the place mm -hmm. to come and rob. We thought you were criminals. That's how really bad it was. But what was happening to the communities where they were noticing things. They were noticing that in their little family gardens, 
They'd go to bed at night, everything was fine. They'd wake up the next morning, all the collard greens, mustard greens had turned black. They noticed that on one side of the house, plants would grow. But on the other side that was downwind from the chemical plant, nothing grew. Everything was dead. Their cars had circles on them. We used to know when their people were from upriver because they had these circles on their cars that looked like from outer space where the paint was eaten away in circles. And you knew that car was from upriver because if they parked it on the side downwind from the chemical plant, the chemicals would literally eat the paint off the car. And their screens were rusting and falling off the windows every few months. They were also sick and dying and they had rare cancers, not your regular, you know, you say, well, we, they, the, the chemical companies could get away with it because the science wasn't there. So they say, oh no, we're not a neurotoxin. So this can't be us because we can show that our chemicals don't produce this particular disease. Well, it wasn't just your chemicals, it's all of them where most communities live with multiple industries, multiple different chemicals. And so it was a cumulative effect of all of that affecting community. They wake up at night throwing up. I get exhausted when I talk about this because it's not changing. So I'm gonna take a break and move on to something better than this. So I don't have to tell you any more about it. I think you got the message. But this is the thing that haunted me and, and pushed me onto my first research project. So I would go into a community while I was writing and I would look over and I'd see slabs like this where houses used to be. And so I asked one gentleman, an elderly gentleman who was involved in the community, I said, well, what's, what's going on over here? He said, well, you know, the boss came by about eight years ago bought all the white folks out, said he was coming back, but we haven't seen it. Really? So where's democracy in this? Where's political clout? Where is your strength in dealing with politicians? Well, white folks had it. They got it, had the power, and they were moved away. The facilities bought them out. And so my first map, and this is one of the first ever GIS maps. This is what they used to look like, y'all, in 1994. I did the first GIS map of the Mississippi River Chemical Carter. In fact, it was the beginning of GIS. They were just figuring out how to do GIS. It cost me $30,000 for this one map back then with a researcher at the University of New Orleans. He was Korean. By the way, he wasn't even American, but he, he knew how to do this. We didn't know anything yet. He was a very brilliant young Korean student at the University of New Orleans. And it was really clear that black people live within three miles of a polluting facility. 80% of black people, 80% of those in the corridor, even in New Orleans, the few little spots we had, guess who lived next door to them? Us. Even when white people live three blocks away, they managed to get further away from pollution than what we did. And I tell people, they laugh when I say this, but you need to have a good white friend. You know, there, there's a communication line out there for white people that we're not in. So you need to have a good white friend so they can tell you all the stuff they know that nobody's telling us about. After Katrina, my really good white friend had some kind of special rider on her insurance. I'm like, what is that? Oh, your insurance person didn't tell you? I said, hell no. So she got more money back to fix her house than I did. I made more money than what she did. But that communication line, I call it the invisible, the white communication line. Get you a good white friend. I know y'all think I'm laughing. I mean, I mean that. I'm very serious because you can get information that's not being departed to you because you're not white. And I'm going to get off preaching. But what happens when communities are marginalized within the democratic process? Well, this is what usually happens to us in race matters. Wherever you have a whole lot of polluting facilities, they give you a park that you can barely go out in because of the air is so horrible. So this is one upriver, and there's one just like it in South Africa. I usually show the two because little boys on it, nobody can tell the difference. And it got mixed up in our 
pictures one time and I'm showing this, I'm like, that's not Cancer Alley. No, it was Cape Town. The exact same picture, little boys on a seesaw next to all of these facilities. So it's not just here. So Louisiana has an awful legacy. Go to the African American Museum and see where slavery started and all of that. We are closely connected to that, that system. But this is a personal story that I don't tell often, but I saw it and decided I would. I was involved in this pollution, this body burden study where they took 14 vials of blood from me some years ago. And I tested positive for 36 to 39 or 75 chemicals in my blood. And everybody who lives within a certain distance of a petrochemical corridor have exactly the same. So if you look back, I had forgotten Vivian Chen was in this study. I looked at it again and I, I see her here. But these were five women, all of us living in places near petrochemical facilities, and we all had all of these chemicals in our blood, which did not exist for your great grandfather or mother. We didn't look like this before the Industrial Revolution. Um, and so the fight for equal protection is here. People began to, communities began to recognize what was going on, but more so for me, I began to recognize that this wasn't just happening in Louisiana. And so from California to Louisiana, all the way across, we began to recognize that this is not a Louisiana thing. This is for the whole United States. And whenever you find what I call a despised minority, that's where all the shit is. It's, don't put that on the tape. That's where all the stuff is. That's where all the stuff is. So I began to meet Native Americans. Lo and behold, all the shit is on the reservations. I met Latinos all across and, and Asian Pacific Islanders, everybody. And wherever that group is kind of like a minority, that's where everything goes. I call it the despised minority syndrome, you know. Give it to the Negroes, you know, give it to the Indians. That's kind of what, just like the old Western movies, I think it goes on just like that. That's how they make a decision. Find somebody you don't like and give it to them. And so, but what happened was this paradigm shift, and I'd like to show uh, Damu Smith here, uh, who passed away very young, no insurance, y'all, hard community worker that happens to a lot of us. Um, but he was, I would call him the community organizer par excellence. I've never met anybody that could organize a community like that. He came down to, to, to Cancer Alley and he organized those communities like you wouldn't believe working with us, but he would go into the community, spend nights before I know, oh, I'm staying with, with Miss, Miss So-and-so. I was like, you're doing what? <laughs> Spending the night and all of that. He was an unbelievable person that we lost way too soon. But that began the, the um, environmental justice movement. And I'm just gonna hit some highlights because if you are who I think you are, you know a lot of this stuff already. I just have some good pictures with it. So this is uh, where it started in Warren County North Carolina with the C PCB that they were putting in a community, um, in a black community. And then we had all of these studies that came out. The first was in 1983, the General Accounting Office. They all said the same thing, toxic waste and race in the United States. And we also had toxic waste and race at 20. I forgot to update that slide. And, and of course, the dumping in Dixie book, they all said the same thing. And all the bad shit was in with us. You can cut it, slice it, give me a thousand different diagrams of 10,000 maps. And it's done over and over and over again. And for this research, it got worse. As the technology got better, guess what? It was worse than what we thought in the first study. The second study was worse. It kept getting worse, not better. And people were organizing. We had the first People of Color Summit in 1991. We had the 1991 National Minority Environmental Health Conference, and there are backstories to all of this. I could keep you in here all night laughing. <laughs> There's a backstory to every one of these. We had 1992, the EPA Equity Report, how we got them to do this study is another backstory. Then we had NEJAC in 1993, 1994. We had the EJ Health and Research Symposium. I was involved in all of this. 
the EJ executive order that was signed. You can't see me because the shortest man in Congress at the time is standing in front of me and he blocked my whole face. So you just see my hair. You see my hair in a red jacket. That's me. Unbelievable. <laughs> so I always have to point me out the red jacket and the hair. That's me. And he was a very short man, but just short enough. And he died in a car accident, I believe. Really nice man. And so all this brought me to the beginning of the environmental justice, uh, of, of, the e, of the Deep South Center for Environmental Justice. And I can't say, I can't say enough about Dr. Norman Francis at Xavier University in New Orleans, Louisiana. He actually hosted the first environmental justice conference. It was a, um, it was a, by SOC, and it was just the Southerners. And when I first started working at Xavier, he had already committed to having that conference on campus. So I moved into a building, and the, the, con the Southern Conference was on the campus. So you have to know him is to love him. And we really started with a $50,000 gift from Dr. Francis to support the concept. He gave me an office. He gave me a phone. I was supposed to be traveling to one of those European um, countries for a conference, but I had left Wake Forest, so Wake wasn't going to pay for it because I'm not there anymore, although we had committed. He paid for it. And I didn't have to put in a lot of pieces of paper. I just talked to him. He said, okay, Bev, go down there and blah, 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 and, I, and he paid for the trip. He's retired. He's now 93 years old, still very short. So I was at Xavier from 1992 to 2005. I went to Dillard 2005 to 2017. And at this point, I'm a standalone nonprofit, no longer having to pay that indirect cost. That's one of the main things. I pay, I pay that to the Deep South Center. That's who gets all of that money. So it's been an unbelievable transition but it's been great. And so you can read what we do, provide opportunities for communities, decision makers. And that took three different meetings to come up with the name and then the mission. Because we started with a group of people, something that I would have done by myself, being inclusive, it took three months. <laughs> and so I'm not changing it. The thought of changing it, you know, really frightens me. I wonder how long it would take now. So that's our mission. And on our objectives, we strive to reach three key objectives, partnership, interaction, and legacy. In other words, we want to be around when I'm gone. I want DSCJ to still be here. And we have three components. It's community engagement, training, education, research, and policy studies, health, and safety education. And our first grant really was the EPA Cup grant, not the NIHS Cup grant. The EPA Cup Grant, which um, Clarice Gaylord was the first director of the Environmental Protection Office of Environment, what is it? Office of Environmental Justice. And I had been talking to her and I submitted my center's concept to her. And I had shared it with a few other people and she called me, she said, Beverly, we just got your, your concept in, in the office. This particular person is trying to get us a to fund their center. Well, it was a snake that I knew, a, a researcher, by the way, on a campus. And so she, she called me and she, I said, what you did when I, she said, I tore it up and threw it in a trash can. That's when you develop relationships as well. So people trying to steal because EPA was talking about funding environmental justice centers to the tune of 16 million, $15 million back then in 92. Never came to light, but the Deep South Center did in spite of it. And that's why we're the first. And we've been in business 33 years consistently. We never shut down, never shut down. So we've been doing this work. And you know what I, what I always say that the, the Deep South Center was founded by a woman. The majority of our workers, nothing against men, are women. And most of my employees were with me over 20 years. None of them left. And except Katrina moved some of them out, some passed away, but I had the same team with the same commitment, with the low salary for all of those years. That's who built this center. And I know I think about Cecil. We talk about this sometimes when we start really getting the money. The people who really worked with us, many of them are gone. 
And what we have coming in now, no comment at this point. We shall see, that's what I'm gonna say. So we started with the CUP grant, it funded, but we also were funded by the Public Welfare Foundation and the program officer was Dana Alston. And I put her name here, I was, when, when it was mentioned this morning, I got teared up. She believed in us. And so I got a $50,000 grant from the Public Welfare Foundation to do community engagement. And she's passed away way too soon as well. And um, I, wanted to, I wanted to do research and work with communities in a different way from what I saw. You know, there were communities upriver. I actually watched a lady take out her purse and try to beat the shit out of one of the researchers and told him, never come back here again. I mean, the relationships were really, really bad. It was extractive. They were just trying to get tenure. And the people were sick and they weren't getting anything back. So that, I looked at that and I'm like, mm, something is really wrong with this. You know, they're not doing research right. And then I, I hawked back to the work I was doing at UNO, which wasn't tenure worthy. But guess what? I got an award because some rich donors who went to UNO decided they wanted to give money to someone at their school who, had, who was doing quality research with communities in New Orleans. And on that whole campus, guess the only person that was doing that kind of work was me. I got a big check. Me and my husband went on a cruise. <laughs> you know, I, I'm in a campus where nobody speaks to me for 10 years, the people on the hall. And when I got that award, they're speaking to me. The good thing for me though, and this is for most minority people at predominantly white schools, the thing was I was home. I was in New Orleans. So the fact that nobody spoke to me at work meant what? Nothing. I had a big community that supported me and they supported me in everything. And I would say to them, I think that I'm, you should be of this world, but not in this world. For anybody who grew up with church people, I did. So I would tell them, I'm of this school, but not in this school. Because I had to separate me, myself from a university that was despised, that during integration flunked every black kid out of the school. My valedictorian, the most brilliant person I ever knew, couldn't get out of that school in 1969. So it has a horrible history. You know, you want to integrate, okay, we're going to fix that. Ain't nobody graduating. And they literally did that. So, you know, then I'm at this school that I don't care nothing about. I only took it because I, my mother was sick and I needed to get home quickly from SUNY at Buffalo, which by the way, thank you, New York. You paid for my education. Louisiana would not say it everywhere I go. If it weren't for your tax dollars, Beverly Wright wouldn't be here. <laughs> <laughs> and I really, really appreciated SUNY at Buffalo was an unbelievable school. I had a secretary that had a PhD. I didn't understand that. But then when I saw the system, if you go, if you work at UB, you can go to school. They gave you six hours a week, free, six hours. You know, you could be gone. So I'm walking around with janitors with degrees. But the retirement system and everything was so good, they weren't leaving. Like leaving, no. So I was around all of these people, janitors, secretaries, with PhDs and master's degrees. You don't want me to tell you what was going on in Louisiana. We had community college presidents with a third, <laughs> third grade education. So the difference was stark. Leaving New Orleans, leaving Louisiana, going to New York. It was unbelievable. It wasn't all good. It wasn't. But it was good for me. Let me say that. And what, what it gave to me was absolutely. Uh, so once again, thank you. So the experience that I had at UNO with the faculty members, how they treated me when I tried to do community work. Then you have Tulane University, all their money coming from the fossil fuel industry. Right? You got LSU, same thing all their money coming from the fossil fuel industry. So you weren't gonna get any good research out of those people because of the ties to money. But I decided I wanted, I could still do what I wanted to do, whether I got tenure or not, which I did get, by the way. Um, and so I'm saying there ought to be some rules. 
you know, about how faculty members work with communities. There ought to be some rules about grants and the monies that come in. So in our CUP grant, 20% of our money went back to the community. I put that in the grant, the first one. They had never seen that before. You know, Clarice said, are you getting money? Uh, you, I said, this is community money for them to attend the workshops for outreach people, all of this. So 20% of that grant went back to the community. What also happened was different for me was that I had been in my little cubby, you know, reading journal articles, writing grants, never got one funded, not one. I started talking to communities, asking people, you know, so what, what is the problem? What do you think the problem is? They tell me, what do you think is causing it? That facility right there, they would, they would tell me. So what do you want? I want my community to be educated. I want to know what's in the air that's making us sick, and I want to know how to protect ourselves from it. So I went back, and I began writing grants based upon what communities told me the problem was and how to fix it. And guess what? I got 13 grants funded in the first year based on information communities gave me. Now, they, weren't, they were like 10,000 here, 30,000 here. I was a writing grant fool for the whole first year. And that's how the Deep South Center eventually got established. I was supposed to go there just to help start it up and go back to my cushy job at Wake Forest, having lunch with Maya Angelou and my children calling her Auntie Maya. They were paying me like 90,000 over eight months back then, 89. I left 32 and went to 90. What a difference. And I left that. I used to say, have you lost your mind? I left that. I was on sabbatical, and I started the center. They kept calling me to come back. I'm like, oh, one more year. They called me again. By the, by the fourth year, they told me I had to make a decision. And they offered me like 90000 or something like that. I went from like 68 to 90 in three years. I was like, have you lost your mind? You're, gonna, you're actually going to stay here? And I did. I had started something and I needed to finish. And so now it's been 33 years and I'm still here. But it's out. The, thank you. So I developed something called the Communiversity Model and its approach to engaging communities and universities to solve environmental justice issues. And this was the first diagram that we had. Like, what's going on here? There's just too much disrespect of communities, no transparency, you know the decision-making process on what research is going to look like was all wrong. So we came up with these principles that are all here in this bowl, and I need to move on. And I'm not going to go through all of this now because I, I know I need to move on. Peggy, I told you this. So the community, <laughs> the community university part partnership model incorporates citizen science, which was not a thing when I started. I, it's now community-based participatory, participatory research, which was not a thing in 92, and research to action methodologies, which was not a thing in 1992. Because I didn't write at that time, like women, we're in the kitchen doing all the work. Other people writing, they come up with titles. I'm like, well, damn, that's what I've been doing, but I didn't write it. Remember that, ladies? Write it down, or you will not get credit for it at any rate. So, if, and we fully embraced environmental justice principles and the integrity of the design. In other words, you, you had to follow certain protocols and with working with communities. And we believe that research is respecting the knowledge and valuing the experiences and input of communities and engaging them in the research as true working partners leads to stronger communities. And I'm gonna skip this so I could get to all of this. We started out with a formalized agreement a memorandum of understanding. So when we started our um, the Mississippi River uh, Mississippi River Corridor Mississippi River Avatar Board, it was all of those communities upriver we had been working with, which was about sixteen of them, and they all had um, we helped them form not five hundred one C's C threes, but they were concerned citizens. We they formed these organizations. And when we applied for a grant, 
That, with that grant, we came up with a, a memorandum of understanding saying, this is what you can expect from us so that you're not expecting me to be able to shut down LDEQ, you know, and so you promised you were going to do this and you didn't. So it was really specific. This is what we're going after. This is what we can do for you and or do with you, which is the way it was most of the time. So I never had a community organization to say anything ugly about me in, in 30 years, not anything because I always made certain that we did what we promised and we did it the way we were supposed to do it. And we pushed the community in front. We were like a tour um, travel agency. You know, we came up with modules, uh, training modules, you know, who's protecting you? That was one of them. Face to face, that's when we called EPA in and LGEQ to meetings to meet with communities. And we sent them to these meetings, we paid for it. We arranged it so that they could develop relationships with these people at, in the enforcement office, right? In the permanent, all of them. We did that for about eight or nine years and transformed the way communities worked with these agencies who were supposed to be protecting them. And I, one of the best things that ever happened to me was to go to a meeting. We also came up with a pocket dictionary for them. It had Rick, or, you know, all of these words in it. And um, Miss Imelda West, who was one of the elders, went to a meeting with EPA and all of this, and they started talking, you know, Rick Russert, well, you know how they talk. And Miss West stood up and she said, look, Sonny, I know what that means. I got my book right here. You're not fooling me. And I was so shocked to see all of those classes. We did classes up and down the river, we had money for 30 people. We gave them like $25 to come to the meeting. We had 100 and 150 people in those meetings. And I would say, look, you know, we don't have the money. We don't need that money. We coming to learn. So word gets out and they see you trying to support them with money, then you must be all right, right? So you don't get 30, you get 60, you get 90. At our recent meetings in Pensacola, Florida, we had 170 people to show up. We ran out of space for the community forum that we did. And I found out that people were, communities were, get, were getting to learn about the Deep South Center in the Deep South. And I'm gonna tell y'all New Yorkers, you don't know the South. You know, it is different from a fight in New York. In fact, I think you all got money from the state for EG, EJ, are you kidding me? When they told me they had money, from the state, Louisiana, that is not about to happen. In fact, they're gonna to try to close down any money you get from anybody for working with communities. Universities, LSU, Tulane, completely owned by the, by the fossil uh, fuel industry. When Tulane had its environmental law clinic that we worked with them and they won one time, they made it illegal for the Tulane lawyers to work with, um, quote, indigenous communities. They passed it through the, through the Senate, the whatever you call those horrible people, the people who are supposed to represent us in the Louisiana state legislature. Whenever we move forward, they control the legislature. The, the, the lobbyists for the fossil fuel industry then go and write the law for them and they vote for it. This is where we are in Louisiana. We've made progress in spite of all of that. The, the emissions have come down. They were at 800 million pounds in 1982, y'all. 800 million pounds of carcinogens in the air in this 85 mile stretch of land. When I looked at the data later, we had better data, it was 1.2 million. That was the self-reporting numbers that they gave us. It was even higher than that. And when we began trying to regulate them, they brought it way down. They didn't even know where it was. They didn't care because nobody was watching. You all had run them out of New Jersey and Ohio with the Ohio River burning and all that stuff. So they were looking for another place. They came to Louisiana and said, oh my God, they don't have any regulations down here. We can really make some money. And that's what they did. 
you know, and hurt those of us who live there. Our work also comes with a roadmap for getting people to their action plan and implementation, and we do this with every community we work in. It begins with a community forum where people come together, and we, it's, I call it a complaining session. You know, you can't make up without the argument, right? So we have the argument first, you know, like, and, and the trash and the what, and we got somebody writing down, writing down, you know, everything. And then after that, we take them to a process that gets them to, so what can we work on now? What do you want first? And when we get to that, that one thing that everybody can agree on, then we start putting the work into action following these steps. And so we've had a lot of wins. Um, this is um, Houston, Texas, working closely with Dr. Denae King at, at TSU. And I think she's here, I don't know, but this is one of the communities she works closely with, and they're also a part of our consortium. Um, but they established its own air monitoring network in the historic black neighborhood of Pleasantville. They identified air as one of their problems. Africatown, they won the approval of the Mobile Zoning Board to establish its safe zone for the Africatown community. ECHO, they halted approval by the Mississippi Permit Board, Sokobi, for a proposed military ammunition storage facility on a contaminated site in the community. This is just, I'm giving you some highlights of some of the things they've done. We had a logic model. These communities reached the short term, reached the long term goal in the short term, which was amazing to me, but they got there very quickly. And um, they, this group, won the approval of the Escambia County Board of Commissioners to develop new permit requirements. It's a community that had like 13 landfills. First they, first they did the hole and take the minerals out and they said, well, what are we gonna do with it? Well, we make it a landfill. And this was going on and on community sick, but they were able to stop the permitting of three additional landfills just recently. And the Law Night Ward, this is an amazing thing. Uh, if you know Law Night Ward, Katrina, devastation, blight. Um, this young woman is quite amazing. She's transformed the space. And I like to show this. I say, this is what environmental justice look like, looks like. That's Regan uh, on the bayou and in a space that was not livable. It was blighted and horrible. She transformed it. So environmental justice communities would not exist if all people were included in a democratic process. So when the man came down and told the black guy, you know, when he was buying out all of the white people's homes across the street from his, if we were involved in that process, it wouldn't have just been the white people that were moved, it would have also been us. And so it would be impossible for me to draw a map, a GIS map, that shows this strange, um, I don't know what I want to call it. You know that song, Strange Fruit? Yeah. yeah, well, that's what it felt like to me when I was doing it. It's just something odd about this. It's not a natural thing that happens between people. It was a pattern, and it was deliberate. It was deliberately done, because we are not involved in the democratic process if you call democratic power to the people, that's what democracy means to me, power to the people, people involved. We're not involved. And so things get done to us, not for us. And so we do a lot of things at DSCJ, but I wanna say this to you, everything that we've done evolved out of something we were doing. So I don't have anything new that didn't come from requests from communities. So we start out just working with communities to reduce emissions. And then Ms. West tells me, Dr. Wright, I'm, I'm, I love you. You know, and I'm so happy that you were able to do this for us, but our children need jobs. Out of that comes what? A job training program. Everything we do in terms of research, it has to do with what communities are being exposed to. So our current problems, the Justice 40, project, just an amazing project to, to really deal with working with communities to make certain that they can access the what we call J40 funding or all the money's coming from through the Biden administration. 
Our last outreach convening, we had 153 community-based organizations in attendance. They're now all in our pipeline to getting them to the point where they actually submit grants and more money is coming and more. It's really an unbelievable project. We started this two years ago and then we got to Tic Tac, which for us is Justice 40. It's all the work we had already been doing. The workforce development, environmental career, we're getting ready to, to incorporate renewable energy like microgrids, um, electric charging, um, um, This is what happens when you get old, your words do go someplace and you have to wait for it to come back in just a second. The panels, you know, the panels. Thank you, solar panels, oh my God. I remember when I did that with my mother and guess what? I'm becoming her. I already see it at 76, I'm more like her now than, what, than before. It just happens in life, but I'm still good. It may take, a, it may take a minute longer, but I still know more than a lot of you sitting out there. You just gotta give me a second sometimes, you know. So we have the Environmental Career Worker Training Program and EC, there are two of them. There's one where we take kids who really need help. It's a 12 week program and it's holistic. So they have individual counseling, they have reading, writing, arithmetic, all of that. And then they do the hazardous waste worker training and we place them in jobs. We have like a 98% job placement rate, sometimes almost 100. And we've been doing it for 25 years. 25 years, we've gotten this award each time. Um, this is some of the pictures. Graduation, they're all so excited. And then we have our HBCU Climate Change Consortium. And out of that consortium comes the HBCU Climate Change Conference. We had 400 people in attendance. We started out with eight universe HBCUs and maybe 30 people in attendance nine years ago. We're now where we had to turn people down. We was like, nope, I'm sorry, we're sold out. We have no more space. It was quite an amazing thing this past year. And we also have a lot of opportunities for, for students. We have a storytelling project sponsored by the National Academy of Sciences. And we have our environmental justice climate climate core with, with young people working with our advisory board members, our HPCU, CBO, climate change consortium. This is these are all projects that fall under that. We have a Gulf Water, which now is a water justice strategic planning project and network. We started out in the Gulf Coast, has been extended past the Gulf Coast at this point. And then we produce a really large study called The More Things Change, The More They Remain, The Same Living and Dying in Cancer Alley. You remember that first map that I did? Well, this is a repeat of that, except we're looking at greenhouse gases and carbon reduction. And um, it's probably what you think. It ain't working. It's not happening. And the emissions in the black community has in fact gone up. And since Katrina, more of us have moved to Cancer Alley. So our population has gone up in the most dangerous areas because of Katrina. Trying to find another place to live with cheaper and that's Cancer Alley. And CERC, this is the Tic Tac. And we are, we are proposing to at least assist 250 community-based organizations in applying for grants that fall under J40 in five years. We got 150 in, on our roadmap right now. So if, if they give us more money, we could double that. We need more money, especially for the grant writing part of it that you know we need. This is what communities need. They need hands-on training. They don't need a professor standing up saying, oh, and, so, and so you do this first and then you do that. They need office hours, that's what we call it, where one person sits with whoever the grant writer is going to be work, whatever the grant person from the community is writing the grant is, and go through it step by step, which is what we tried to do at our last convening. We had office hours with EPA, DOE, all of these organizations and the community people loved it because they, they actually had, at this time, you got your 20 minutes to make the contact with the D DOE person, with the EPA person. And they got all their information, you know, everything they needed to know, 
with a one-on-one -on -one type of um, conversation. And I think that professors, because I am still that, we forget that we're working with community people and it requires an extra step most of the time, unless they've been lucky and they've gotten these really young kids now working with them who know everything about the computer. So in our Justice 40 project, we gave them $50,000 specifically to hire a young person to be their number two. The ones who did it, boy, they're just speeding through the process. The ones who didn't, we didn't tell them they had to do it. You know, we said we would suggest and you identify that person to work with us. The ones who did it, they're now in what we call exemplar. They're ready for that $20 million grant they've organized. And the outreach part, part of it was simply this. We found community-based organization leaders who are known in their community. We brought them in as hub leaders. Their job was to bring in 10 other community members, regardless community-based organizations, regardless of where they were, into their hub. So, you know, radio ads and all of that, word of mouth is the best thing. And we had 100, we can prove it's true because we have 153 community-based organizations now, and the community university model works, and we can show where we've won. It's been refined over 30 years, looking at what's wrong, changing it, fixing it, it is a model that works. And I am gonna end here. <sighs> Thank you. Thank you. And, and I really mean that we strive to work ourselves out of a job and hoping that we are just a memory in history of a group that tried to do something right. All right, thank you, Dr. Bev. Dr. Wright was giving us a master class in environmental justice, so thank you very much. <laughs> uh, I know we're over time a little bit, but we're gonna take uh, just a, a little bit of uh, time over and uh, introduce our guest here, Dr. Jalan White Newsom. I'm uh, Ana Baptista. I'm the Tishman Center co-director here at the New School University. And we're gonna do just a little bit of a fireside chat, minus the fire, um, and, and talk about uh, Dr. Bev's offerings for us this evening. So um, let me introduce Dr. Jalan. Um, Dr. Jalan White Newsom joined the Biden Harris administration in June 2022. She's the senior director for environmental justice at the White House Council on Environmental Quality. Um, under her leadership, the EJ team is working to deliver benefits to communities that need them most. And her team works to move forward President Biden's ambitious EJ agenda, including implementing the recently signed executive order to revitalize our nation's commitment to environmental justice for all, which was signed last year, and releasing the first ever environmental justice scorecard, advancing Justice 40, which Dr. Bev mentioned in her talk, and launching the White House campaign for environmental justice. And Dr. White Newsom became the first ever federal chief environmental justice officer in 2023, which is a position we probably never thought would happen. <laughs> it's a big and milestone. She's a native of Detroit and she's tackled environmental challenges from a wide range of positions and perspectives, including uh, doing quite a bit of time working with grassroots EJ movement leaders in philanthropy, state government, academia as well. Uh, before joining the White House, Dr. Newsom founded the em Low, uh, Empowering a Green Environment and Economy LLC, which is a strategic consulting firm that focused on transforming communities using people-centered solutions to combat climate change. And she also served as the director of federal policy for WEAC. So Dana's job here. So <laughs> she worked with uh, WEAC and managed federal policy in the DC office and um, did early EJ advocacy and research focused on air pollution, climate, uh, climate change, flooding, and uh, improving the health of low income communities of color. She has a PhD in environmental health sciences from University of Michigan School of Public Health, who's here with us as well, <laughs> and a master's degree in environmental engineering from Southern Methodist University and a bachelor's degree in chemical engineering from Northwestern University and a certificate in diversity and inclusion from Cornell. She's a proud wife and mom of two daughters like myself. Uh, so we want to thank Dr. Jalan White Newsom for coming and joining us in this conversation this evening. 
And I'm really just going to start out, I really just have two questions, really. One is offering any reflections you have on this master class that Dr. Wright offered us. And two is, because you're here from the White House, uh, we really want to hear from you your thoughts on, you know, what is the moment that we're in in terms of historic federal investment? We heard a little bit about some of that investment that um, Dr. Wright's center is leveraging. What is it going to take? What kinds of partnerships do we need to build to ensure that that funding has the greatest impact in the communities that need it most. And we have a lot of universities here in the room and listening, so it's also some advice, some guidance on how we make those partnerships actually work for justice and centering justice. Well, first of all, uh, thank you for the opportunity to be here and to share this space. Thank you for your leadership, Dr. Anna. Thank you for the entire staff, um, those that have made this facility um, warm, and, and welcoming to us, so, so just want to appreciate everybody. What I will say is that, uh, I mean, Dr. Wright obviously has created a powerful legacy. So sitting there listening and seeing your slides and hearing your story in some parts that I didn't know, the question that I'm always asking myself and my staff and that I would present to each of you in here is what is your legacy going to be? And I want you to really think about that because we all have our own story. We all have our why we are sitting in this room today. And when I think about my story and my why, it's because I had parents, I had a family that really instilled in me that this world and what you do is not about you, it's about other people. Today is the anniversary of my father's 13th year of his death. And when I think about as a lawyer, what he did and who he fought for. When I think about my mom who said, your job is to make sure those folks that for some reason don't have a voice that have been screwed by the system, you're supposed to help them use your power and privilege in a good way. And so all of that, my little story, and, and hearing your, again, story, Dr. Wright, it just says, and even just instills in me even more, what is gonna be the legacy that we're gonna leave in this room? So when I think about the honor and privilege it is to serve in the White House at this moment in time as the first federal chief environmental justice officer, I don't take that lightly. When I think about this work, it is a ministry for me, right? So sitting here and being in this space today listening, hearing the stories of joy, hearing the stories of challenge, but really leaving with this sense of joy and community, you know, it's inspiring to me. So each one of you, by your words and by your presence, inspires me. And what I do is take that back to my staff that, again, at the Council on Environmental Quality that is charged with advancing the most ambitious environmental justice agenda this country has ever seen. And it's not like we have a staff of 50 people, right? To, to do something that many folks think is impossible. But what I tell my staff every day, our job is to make the impossible possible because it's not about us. It's about the people sometimes that we don't see. <laughs> the people that don't have the privilege to travel to DC and come to our office or lobby on the Hill or do whatever. So when I think about this moment, Dr. Anna, we don't have time to waste. And so what's awesome is that in addition to the Environmental Justice Executive Order being signed, I guess I have to say last year, we have some powerful partnerships that I think you know, have developed just because of this moment. And so when we're talking about today, as I listen to the importance of power, po powerful partnerships and what makes them work, is that there's a lot of, lot of criteria, but basically in a partnership, you want everybody to benefit in some way, right? It's not a partnership if one person is getting more than the other, right? So it's not ever gonna be perfect, but you want somebody, some organization, some community, some executive office to be a little bit better than where you started because everybody has gifts and unique abilities to bring to something. So when I think about the unique partnerships that we have to activate in this moment in time, 
CEQ, Council on Environmental Quality. How many of y'all know what CEQ is? Have you heard of it? Okay, oh, that's fantastic. That's more than I usually get, so I don't assume, because I didn't know a lot about what they did before I got here. But basically, when I think about some of the most powerful partnerships that we have now in this administration, it's in our executive office of the president, because the Justice 40 initiative that Dr. Bev talked about, basically saying that 40% of the benefits of all these trillions of dollars that are coming down has to go into certain communities. That's a partnership between CEQ, the Office of Management and Budget, and the Climate Policy Office. That is a powerful partnership, and then we will only be successful if we work together. When I think about the partnerships of our federal agencies, because again, when you talk about this being a long game, it's important that we think about institutionalizing environmental justice so it doesn't just like flow with the wind and change with administration or leadership. So our federal agency partners are critical to institutionalizing environmental justice. And one key partnership is our White House Environmental Justice Interagency Council, which has EJ officers from every federal agency that have said, I'm gonna dig in and figure out how I'm gonna make our practice and policy better to actually meet this moment. That's a powerful partnership that in many ways didn't exist before. And I also think about our partnership with community. Part of that being through the WEJAC, and we have WEJAC representation here, our White House Environmental Justice Advisory Council. You know the government has a lot of acronyms, but basically the WEJAC, in, in my words, keeps us in check. Right, it keeps us on our toes. It, it helps us to elevate and play that inside outside game. Like it's not just me saying this isn't right. It's this community of scholars and community activists that are saying you all need to do better and holding us accountable. So again, when we talk about partnerships, it's not about achieving perfection, but it's about making sure that you're leaving something in someone in some community in some place, some government better than how you found it. And doc, Dr. Bev, maybe I could ask you, you, you've worked the whole trajectory of lots of different federal administrations and lots of uh, folks coming in and out of, of that office and those agencies. Is there something, some insight you'd like to share about what you've learned about working and in those relationships, how those relationships have changed and how you tap into that now that you have this money there that maybe wasn't there before? Yes, I do have something to say, but first I want to say this. Those drummers were amazing, right? <laughs> I, you saw Dr. Bev was the first one up, so we had to. Oh my God, you know, I am from New Orleans. We're going into the Mardi Gras season. All of you should have been up on your feet. If you were in New Orleans, this would have been a rocking room, I'm telling yeah. you, before it was over. With. But I, I saw that some of you did kind of get into it, but. Um, you know, I, I, rhythm is in my whole body. It, it's just, you know, in my neighborhood, I would hear it playing, the Mardi Gras. It's just a part of who I am. So if you see me get up anywhere and shake my booty, as they say, you know, blame it on my culture. I love it. But what I want to say is the one thing that I have learned over all these years is the person that's put to head an organization is very important having that kind of leadership. And I can give you a real example. The National Institute of Environmental Health Sciences eventually came out with a grant that was a partnership grant, something like the CUP grant that we got at EPA. But when we first started out, I was um, Dr. Oden, who just didn't believe any of this stuff that we, he thought we were exaggerating. We actually got him to come to Cancer Alley and take this tour. Just like the rest of us, he had a headache by the time he left because the emissions were so high. It transformed him. And he went back to the agency and transformed that agency in ways that have to do with research at universities and community partners. So the, the person at the top makes a big difference. Then having um, imagination. You know, you need a person who has some imagination. First of all, they need a vision and then they need to imagine. And that imagination deals with all the rules on the book. How do you still get what you want or make some change with those rules on the book? Because the petrochemical industry knows all the tricks. 
They have great imagination. But then we get people in office, they leave. They have none. I just can't do it. I can't it, it, say we can't do it. And then uh, somebody says, well, you know, maybe you can. You know, we can use this to do something else. And I'm really thinking about what Regan did in Louisiana when it came to extremely dangerous chemicals where the communities could never get it to show the cumulative impact of it. Well, then we, we found out. It's because the chemical um, people, the powerful groups dealing with chemicals, had gone to EPA and worked on the way, the rules around testing chemicals in communities. And they did it, they scattered it. So they'd only pick one extremely dangerous chemical a year, and four years later, they'd do another one, and then four years later, they do another one. Well, he said, and he said this to me, well, we can change that. We can make it so that these most dangerous chemicals are looked at at one time in one community. Now, I've been working with GEQ EPA for 40 years. Nobody ever told me that, that you can change it. And we found out this was put there on purpose. So you never saw the full burp a toxic burden in communities. That takes imagination. That takes innovation. That takes having a mission, a goal. If your goal is really to protect communities, then you look at everything differently. The rule says no, but does it say no? Is there some other way that we can do it? So picking the right leader of an agency, becoming involved in those processes when the administration is trying to pick a leader right in, we need to be involved in that because I'm telling you, it makes such a difference. And I've seen that from no movement at all ever, regardless of who was at, at the top at, at EPA, I mean, of the United States, no movement in Louisiana. And I agree, Louisiana is tougher than most places. It really is. It's different. It's a different animal. But then, how we can get together and try to figure out this is the law, yes, but we may be able to do something that could at least reduce the burden. Leadership, the same thing with the Biden administration, $60 billion. Of course, we're getting a whole lot of the crap now, but at least I got money, I can fight you. <laughs> you actually gave me the money to fight, that I could stay open and fight. Before I had no money and you were screwing us, you know? I got money now so I can fight and have a voice and then remember when you do us harm. Nobody stays in forever, right? Just have a long memory. When it comes back around, you know what to do. Make certain they're not any place in any administration because of their past. Don't forget who your enemy was and make sure they don't come back. Good advice and keep your uh, keep that memory that <laughs> alive. So I think one, one last you know point of reflection. Maybe go back to Jalan and we heard some suggestions about it matters who, who's in leadership. It matters how you use your creativity um, and you know in interpreting the rules <laughs> and applying the the rules. And you're in you've been in government, but you've also been in academia. You've been in the grassroots EJ sector across all these sectors, do you have advice to our university partners, our community group partners about that kind of willingness, what it takes, what kind of creativity it takes to really push the boundaries sometimes? Because I'm sure you've been in positions in all of these different sectors where you've had to stretch, right, to center justice. It's not written in the rules necessarily. And if you have any examples, like even in the Biden administration about the institutionalization, you know, because we have the executive order, but it's not law. And we have Justice 40, but it's an executive order form. So how do we institutionalize some of these commitments that have come out so that they last beyond this administration, right? So if you have any thoughts or closing advice on that, we welcome those. I'm trying to think where to start. Um, I mean, you know, a lot of this stuff is about building relationship. And, you know, as I say to most folks, we're the Council on Environmental Quality. 
Um, it's not that we can take away money from folks because we really don't give money to folks, right? So what what is the reason why an agency would change the way they're operating? Just because we tell them, no, just because it's the right thing to do? I mean, maybe, but it's really trying to say, hey, you know, this is where we're at now. This is where we're trying to be. How can we help you get from point A to point B? And, and this is why we need to look at this differently. And what we can't do is come in and assume that everybody is starting with the same foundation. Just because we have an executive order and we have a bunch of words, that does not translate the same way to every person and every leader within an agency. So it takes a little bit of patience. It takes a little bit of education. It takes a little bit of time because when you think about the, the 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 Titanic that we're trying to shift in this time frame, where you're thinking and about agencies that have been doing the same thing for decades, and we're asking them to oh use a mapping tool to figure out where the resources should go, oh collect data that we've never collected before, like you can't do that overnight, and putting on my academic hat, you know, you can get some data, but that data could be crap and be telling the wrong story. So, you know, we have to be, and it's hard because on the outside, it looks like we're not moving and doing anything. But trust me, inside this administration, we have good people that have just needed, I think, this administration to say, hey, now there is a willingness and there is a push to actually do the things that we've been trying to do to really advance environmental justice and see what that means from the Department of Labor to the Department of Energy. So, you know, for me, it, it is about building those relationships, building trust with the agencies, you know, allowing folks to mess up and learn um, and having a little bit of humility. And, and I think we're in this, again, wonderful position to make some changes, if we do it right, that will last beyond us. So everything that we are trying to do now, which is, again, frustrating because folks wanna see a quick turnaround. You wanna see stuff happen, you wanna see stuff changing. Just because we're getting putting a gazillion dollars out there, you might not see that change tomorrow. But Lord have mercy, if we set the foundation right now, you will see, your children you'll see, your grandchildren will see those changes and the benefits that we are laying out. So, you know, my advice, again, as community members, as advocates, continue to elevate your voice. As I say to folks, you know, I, I'm a little sensitive, so I won't say I don't take everything personal, but, you know, push us, you know, it, it, if we're not doing something right, if we can do something better, if you have an idea, if you feel like we're not using our imagination, tell us, whether it's a phone call, an email, showing up at a public meeting, we need that pressure from the outside. So that's a good thing. So remember, your voice is just as important as anybody else. In terms of my academics, you know, I have always been in this role of adjunct professor for a reason because I said I don't like politics, I don't like dealing with bureaucracy, and I'm kind of at the highest level now, which is totally reverse of what I planned for my life. <laughs> but again, there are so many models of great academics, and whether it's Dr. Anna, Dr. Kyle, and I think about the young man that said this is his first job in Clinton, New York earlier today, like learn from folks. You know, don't let that system or institution shape you. You shape it. You're starting out. You have this opportunity to kind of just set the field. And I remember, you know, because I taught environmental health for about 12 years at George Washington University. And, you know, we'd have, you know, the core curriculum, but it was like, well, why aren't we talking about, how can we not talk about environmental justice in the environmental health class? So it's like, making these little efforts to, to put pieces in that matter. Um, so I would say again, you know, use your privilege for good, I always say that. And then to my foundation family, I mean, I think I said this all the time, I had the opportunity to be a funder for several years and, you know, it, it, there are good things happening, but there's still some shifts that need to happen. Um, you know, I think someone said earlier, and I'll just underscore, don't go for the new shiny thing, right? 
don't be so quick to change in a cycle, in a grand period, you know, stick with it, stay with it. The basics are still the same that community organizations need. They need back office support. They need to be able to pay their folks a living wage. And I mean, just the basics. Like if we can just get the basics and we build this, again, solid foundation of community leaders, like that, that solves a lot of it. So don't be afraid. And, you know, usually, I, anyway, I won't go there. Like, don't be afraid to, to push and do something different. Um, I will say, again, I, I had the opportunity to be at a pretty progressive foundation, but it was still an institution. It was not perfect. So don't be afraid to push wherever you are. And particularly if you're a student, oh my gosh, we need you so much. You know, that intergenerational piece and it is, is so critical. So, I, I mean, my goodness, I'll just end with like, everybody has a wonderful set of superpowers in this room figure out how to use them, figure out how to use them together. Because I will tell you, we as a government will fail without partnership. We need you. <laughs> every sense, every community activist, every foundation partner, we need you because we cannot do this alone. Thank you. Okay, I think we are going to wrap it up. And does Dr. Bill, you want to close us out here? Yeah, I forgot you told me funders were here. So Ooh, she's now. I forgot about that. And the one thing that I want to say is that environmental justice organizations need to be endowed. The ones that have proven track records, and I'm not just speaking for mine. Of course, I think mine should be endowed. <laughs> But I'm not just speaking for me. It's the ones who have been here, have meet all the criteria of a, you know, a stable organization. They should be endowed. I mean, Sierra Club, um, what is it, 100 million endowments? I mean, you look at all of these um, green organizations, the big greens, and how they're, nobody ever thinks about, well, maybe we ought to endow, you know, a group that's doing really good work. Just, just imagine, I tell people, look what I did with nothing. Just imagine if you had given me some money. You know, you really want to see change? So I, I, every time I speak to funders, I say, think endowment. How'd you think to endow EDF or Sierra Club or all of them? Universities. universities. And that's where I got the idea from, all of these endowments at universities. But that's what we need to be working on so that we can live on, you know, until we solve this particular issue. And there'll always be another one, morph to the other issue, it keeps moving. But endowment is, of course, the thing. And please try to fund organizations for five years. If you want us to be stable, you want to see change, change is slow. A five-year grant is about what it takes to really see that change. So the only way we get five years is that we go to different, different uh, foundations and get the money to do the same thing. You know, and so when you add it all up, you got about five years to work on this one issue. And it takes a long time to figure out how to do that as well, to keep, keep for them to keep funding you. But longer term grants and Thinking about endowing centers, I think is the thing that could make us more stable and make communities stronger and better and more resilient. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Wright, for closing out. Thank you, Dr. Jalan White Newsom, for joining us for this conversation. And thank you to our audience for sticking with us longer. Uh, good evening, and I hope you guys have a wonderful night. And thank you to our speakers. Yeah.